In Mark 7, verse 18 through 19, Jesus says, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. This seems to be an open and shut case that Jesus abrogated the Jewish dietary laws. Verse 19 says, Thus Jesus declared all foods clean. This poses a major problem for Messianic Judaism because Messianic Judaism affirms that Jewish followers of Jesus are responsible to obey the commandments that set Israel distinct from the nations. And in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14, God identifies certain animals as unclean for Israel to eat, and he prohibits us from eating them. The Torah's dietary laws have been a marker of Jewish identity, and obedience to those laws has been a sign of faithfulness to the God of Israel since those commands were given through the Second Temple period and up to today. So, what do we do with Mark 7.19? In a sermon on this text, Pastor John MacArthur commented, In the words that Jesus said, He declared all foods clean. In one simple statement, He obliterated all the dietary laws of Judaism. Pastor John MacArthur is presenting the traditional way Christians have understood Mark 7, 19. Jesus does away with the Torah's dietary laws. But is that right? I don't think so. And in this video, I'm going to explain why. First, I'm going to give you five reasons why the traditional reading of Mark 7, 19 is implausible. And then we're going to read Mark 7, verse 15 through 19 in its Jewish context to understand what Jesus was actually arguing. Let's start with the first reason why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7. Here it is. Jesus states that he did not come to abolish the Torah. In Matthew 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. This one line tells us Jesus' view of the Torah and Judaism. The word translated as abolish is katalusai, from kataluo, a word which other ancient Jewish authors use to describe the Seleucid king Antiochus IV's attempt to abolish Judaism. For example, in the 2nd century BCE, the author of 2nd Maccabees writes the following in chapter 2, verse 21 through 22. Judah Maccabee and his brothers fought bravely for Judaism, so that though few in number, they regained possession of the temple, famous throughout the world, and liberated the city, and reestablished the laws that were about to be abolished, while the Lord with great kindness became gracious to them. In the 1st century CE, the author of 4th Maccabees writes the following in chapter 17, verse 9. Here are buried an old priest, an old woman, and seven sons because of the violence of the tyrant who wished to abolish the way of life of the Hebrews. The use of the word kataluo in these texts show how other Jews around the time of Jesus were using the word abolish in the context of Jewish law. The first century Jewish historian Josephus uses kataluo in the same way. And given this context and that Jesus' discussion in Matthew 5, verse 17 through 19 is about keeping the commandments, it stands to reason that the language Matthew uses to communicate Jesus' words in Matthew 5, 17 expresses Jesus' firm opposition to the abolishment of Judaism, the ways of life of the Jewish people. And this is key because a primary way Antiochus attempted to rid his empire of Judaism was by forcing Jews to eat pork. This is evident in several ancient texts. 4th Maccabees 5 verse 2 through 3 reads, Antiochus ordered the guards to seize each and every Hebrew to compel them to eat pork and food sacrificed to idols. If any were not willing to eat defiling food, they were to be broken on the wheel and killed. This is a Jewish text that was probably written between 50 and 100 CE, the same time period the New Testament was written. In chapter 5, the author describes how Antiochus forced Jews to eat pork in his attempt to rid his empire of Judaism. For a Jew to eat pork during this time was his or her demonstration that they renounced Judaism and the God of Israel. The author of 1 Maccabees, writing in the 1st century BCE, states in chapter 1, verse 62 through 63, 
But many in Israel stood firm and were resolved in their hearts not to eat unclean food. They chose to die rather than to be defiled by food or to profane the holy covenant, and they did die. In 2 Maccabees 7 verse 1 through 2, the author writes, It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and being compelled by the king under torture with whips and thongs to partake of unlawful swine's flesh. One of them acting as their spokesman said, What do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our ancestors. Antiochus brutally tortured and killed a mother and her seven sons because they refused to eat pork, and these were not Antiochus's only victims. For Jews during this time, obeying the commandment to not eat pork had incredible significance. It was a demonstration of their covenant faithfulness to God. To obey the king's command to eat pork would be to go along with the king's mission to abolish Judaism. God made a covenant with Israel for a Jew to eat pork would be tantamount to throwing away the wedding ring. Jewish scholar Dr. Ismar Shorch writes, By the time we come to the second book of Maccabees, authored perhaps as late as the first century CE, the eating of pork was deemed to be a betrayal of Judaism at the deepest level. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus says that he did not come to stop Jews from keeping the commandments, meaning he did not come to abolish Judaism. The first reason why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7 is because if he did, he would be betraying Judaism at the deepest level. He would be contradicting the Torah, both of which exactly contradicts what Jesus says in Matthew 5.17. For a more in-depth look at Matthew 5.17, check out the video in the description below. A second reason why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7 is because he wears tzitziot. We see this in Mark 6 verse 56, which says, And wherever Jesus went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. What were the people touching? The fringe of his cloak. This is a reference to Jesus' tzitzit. As a devout Jew, Jesus wore fringes or tzitziot on the corners of his garment in obedience to the command in Numbers 15 verse 37 through 40, which says, Speak to the Israelite people and instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. Let them attach a cord of blue to the fringe at each corner. Thus you shall be reminded to observe all my commandments and to be holy to your God. A few things to note here. First, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Tanakh, uses the same Greek word we find in Mark 6.56 to translate the word fringes. This further indicates that the reference to Jesus' fringe on the edge of his cloak is a reference to his tzitzit. Second, the reason God instructs Jews to wear tzitzit is to remind them to observe all the commandments. By wearing tzitzit, Jesus commits himself to obey the whole Torah, all the Jewish specific commandments that apply to him, which includes obedience to the Torah's dietary laws. Jesus is a rabbi, and as such, he models for his Jewish disciples the wearing of tzitziot. Thus, he expects his Jewish disciples to obey the whole Torah, which again includes the Torah's dietary laws. Would it make any sense that Jesus would abrogate the Jewish dietary laws right after teaching through his actions that the whole Torah is binding on the Jewish people? Think about it. Mark 6 verse 56 is just one verse before Mark 7. A third reason why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7 is because in Matthew 23 verse 23 through 24, Jesus' argument with Pharisees assumes his Jewish brothers are responsible to obey the Torah's dietary laws. Let's read the text. Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. 
Jesus tells these Pharisees that they are obeying the commandment in Deuteronomy 14 to tithe their produce. They even tithe their spices. He says they should keep doing this, but they are failing to observe the more important commandments, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. And he illustrates their hypocrisy by saying they strain out gnats from their drinks, but if they don't keep the more important commandments, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, they might as well have eaten a camel. Jesus' argument only makes sense because Jesus and the Pharisees have the mutual understanding that camels and gnats are unclean for Israel to eat. Jesus' argument is dependent on the continuing validity of the Torah's dietary laws. It's implausible that Jesus abrogated the Jewish dietary laws in Mark 7 because he assumes his fellow Jews are still responsible to obey the Torah's dietary laws. A fourth reason why it's implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7 is because he criticizes the Pharisees present for disobeying the Torah. Let's start by reading Mark 7, verse 1 through 5. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Judeans do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? What does Mark mean when he says the tradition of the elders? We learn about this in a brief comment by the Jewish historian Josephus in Jewish Antiquities 13297, when he writes, what I would now explain is this, that the Pharisees have delivered to the people a great many observances by succession from their fathers, which are not written in the law of Moses. And for that reason, it is that the Sadducees reject them and say that we are to esteem those observances to be obligatory, which are in the written word, but are not to observe what are derived from the tradition of our forefathers." Here we learn that the Pharisees have preserved observances from their ancestors that are not written in the Torah, but still consider obligatory. One of these observances is ritual hand washing before meals. In Mark 7, some of Jesus' disciples decide not to participate in this tradition, and the Pharisees present ask, Why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Jesus responds, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you might have had from me is korban, that is an offering to God, then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you have handed on, and you do many things like this. Jesus refers to a tradition the Pharisees followed that allowed a person to devote their possessions to God upon their death, called Korban. The Pharisees avoid using their possessions to care for their parents in their old age. Jesus' point is that they are upholding their tradition, but in doing so, they are breaking the commandment in Exodus 20 verse 12, to honor your father and mother. Keeping their tradition causes them to break one of the Ten Commandments. Keeping that in mind, New Testament scholar Dr. Matthew Thiessen makes the following observation. Mark's Jesus stresses the necessity of keeping God's commandments. Consequently, any reading that depicts Jesus as rejecting God's commandments to Israel to avoid eating unclean animals results in a Jesus who is irrational at best and deeply hypocritical at worst. Is Mark so bumbling a narrator that he fails to notice this result himself? Here's the point. The fact that Jesus criticizes the Pharisees present for disobeying the Torah makes it implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws just a few verses later. 
And I just want to make a quick side note that I find really fascinating from the Mishnah in Nedarim 9.1. Rabbi Eliezer argues that a person may break a vow if the vow would prevent them from honoring their parents. And when one rabbi tries to contradict him, the sages ultimately side with Rabbi Eliezer. I find it fascinating that Jesus' view is in harmony with the later rabbis that honoring one's parents is more important than keeping a tradition. Okay, now a fifth reason why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws in Mark 7. The Jewish people present do not think Jesus is claiming to eliminate the Torah's dietary laws. Let's read what Jesus says in Mark 7 verse 14 through 15. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. Matthew records the same account, but he includes the Pharisees' reaction to Jesus' argument. Check it out in Matthew 15, verse 10 through 12. Then he called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What defiles a person is not what goes into the mouth, it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that when the Pharisees heard this saying, they were offended? What do we learn here? First, the Jewish crowd was not offended by Jesus' teaching. Only the Pharisees are offended. If Jesus was teaching against the Jewish dietary laws, the Pharisees would not simply be offended. They would see Jesus as invalidating what Jews were willing to give up their lives for in allegiance to the God of Israel. They would call Jesus out as a false prophet, leading Israel astray from the commandments. The Jewish crowds would join in opposing Jesus speaking against the Torah. But that did not happen. These Jewish people, hearing Jesus' words, Jesus' disciples, the crowds, and the Pharisees, do not think Jesus claims the Torah's dietary laws are abolished. So, quick question. Who should we turn to when interpreting Jesus in this Jewish context? Pastor John MacArthur and other theologians who say Jesus is opposing the Jewish dietary laws? Or Jesus' original Jewish hearers? It is implausible that Jesus abolished the Jewish dietary laws because 1. Jesus states that he did not come to abolish the Torah and Judaism. 2. He wears tzitzit, which serves as a commitment to obey all the commandments. 3. When Jesus criticizes Pharisees in Matthew 23, his argument assumes that his fellow Jews are still responsible to maintain a kosher diet. 4. Jesus criticizes the Pharisees present in Mark 7 for not keeping the Torah. And five, the Jewish people present do not think Jesus claims the Jewish dietary laws are abolished. Okay, so now you might be asking, well then, what was Jesus arguing? I'm glad you asked. Let's read Mark 7 verse 15 again. There is nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. The only way to understand Jesus' argument is by examining it in its Jewish context. In Mark 7 verse 15, Jesus focuses on the source of impurity and the direction it moves. From the Pharisees' perspective, the source of impurity is defiled food itself. If someone contracts impurity and say they touch their bread without ritually washing their hands, that impurity travels from their defiled hands to the bread and into them when they eat the now defiled food. An example of this teaching is found in Mishnah Taharot 10.4. If the grapes are taken from the grape basket or from what is spread out on leaves, all the above-mentioned, Beit Hallel and Beit Shammai, agree that they must be handled with clean hands, for if they are handled with unclean hands, they become unclean. In Mishnah Taharot 9.5 we read, He who crushes olives with impure hands defiles them. Contrary to the Pharisees, Jesus teaches that the source of impurity comes from inside a person and travels out of them. As Jesus says in Mark 7:15, there is nothing outside of a person that can defile him by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles him. Jewish Talmudic scholars, Dr. Yair Furstenberg and Dr. Daniel Boyarin, point out that Jesus is presenting the Torah's view of impurity, in contrast to the Pharisees' innovation, which contradicts the Torah. I'll explain. According to the Torah, the source of impurity comes from the inside, it comes from the body. And whether that impurity is ritual or moral, it travels out from a person. 
For a quick list, consider the following. On ritual impurity, we see menstruation, genital discharge, and childbirth. On moral impurity, we see sexual sins, idolatry, and bloodshed. Dr. Daniel Boyarin writes, According to the Torah, only that which comes out of the body can contaminate, not foods that go in. Thus, if the Pharisees argue that food itself contaminates, that is a change in the law. In Mark 7, Jesus engages in an intra-Jewish halakhic debate, answering the Pharisees' question about why some of Jesus' disciples do not ritually wash their hands before eating. Jesus is arguing against the Pharisees' view of the source of impurity and the direction it moves. Keeping this context in mind, Dr. Yair Furstenberg rephrases Mark 7.15 in the following way. Jesus says, Contrary to your halakha, which is unknown in the Bible, the body is not defiled by eating contaminated food, rather it is defiled by what comes out of it. The Pharisees' innovation is that defilement comes from outside the body. If one does not ritually wash their hands, the ritual defilement contracts to the food they touch and then enters their body. Jesus states the Torah's position. Defilement comes from inside the body and moves from the inside out. Jesus is not giving a new teaching, releasing Jews from the obligation to abide by the Torah's dietary instructions. He is succinctly teaching what the Torah says about impurity. You might be thinking to yourself, okay, but don't Jews become defiled if they were to eat pork or shellfish? To answer that question, let's read Leviticus 11 verse 1 through 4 and then skip to verse 7. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, From among all the land animals, these are the creatures that you may eat. Any animal that has divided hooves and is cleft-footed and chews the cud, such you may eat. But among those that chew the cud or have divided hooves, you shall not eat the following. The camel, for even though it chews the cud, it does not have divided hooves. It is unclean for you. The pig, for even though it has divided hooves and is cleft-footed, it does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. One thing I want to highlight first. Leviticus 11 does not say that camels and pigs are unclean, period. The text says that these animals are unclean for you. The you here is the people of Israel. Pork and shellfish and camels, these are unclean for Jews to eat. They are not unclean for Gentiles. There are examples of Gentile believers in the New Testament who abstain from eating foods that God forbids Jews to eat. And God may personally lead a Gentile follower of Jesus to join a Messianic congregation today where keeping a kosher diet is expected. But the point remains, Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 instruct Israel, the Jewish people, to not eat certain foods. This is not an instruction that includes all Gentiles. God's instruction is for Jewish people to not eat certain foods, and we get the reason for this in Leviticus 11 verse 43 through 44, which says, Do not defile yourselves by any of these creatures. Do not make yourselves unclean by means of them, or be made unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore be holy, because I am holy. God sets up the dietary instructions for Israel to make Israel distinct as Israel. It is a matter of holiness and thus belongs to the defilement category that is closest to the category of moral defilement, though it is certainly not on the same level of sin as sexual sins, murder, or idolatry. We read in Leviticus 20 verse 25 through 26, you shall not draw abomination upon yourselves through beast or bird or anything with which the ground is alive, which I have set apart for you to treat as unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and I have set you apart from other peoples to be mine. Moral defilement is what leads Israel into exile, and the punishment Israel will endure for eating forbidden food is exile. The point of the laws has to do with maintaining the way God calls Israel to be holy. Jewish scholar Dr. Jonathan Clawans writes, 
The outright prohibitions of eating certain foods function more like a moral defilement than a ritual one. Still, it certainly cannot be said that the dietary laws function on par with sexual, idolatrous, or murderous sins, which bring about much more severe consequences. Returning to the question, does a Jew become defiled when he or she eats pork? Yes, but they are not defiled from the pork itself. Pork is not in itself unclean. The defilement comes from disobeying God's instruction not to eat it. The defilement comes from the inside. It is the disobedience which comes from the heart. In Mark 7.15, Jesus is not saying the Jewish dietary laws are no longer obligatory. Within the context of an intra-Jewish halakhic debate about hand-washing, Jesus argues that the Pharisees change the source of impurity and reverse the direction it moves. According to the Torah, impurity does not enter the body, it comes out of the body. Dr. Yair Furstenberg concludes, It seems then that no biblical source actually suggests that contamination can spread through ingestion. In the Hebrew Bible, eating, unlike emission or discharge, is not a means of transferring defilement. Only in later purity laws, influenced by the Pharisaic hand-washing practice, as well as other factors, does concern with ingesting impurity become a major theme. But what about Mark 7.19, the famous verse that says, Thus Jesus declared all foods clean. Given our study of Mark 7 so far, that verse seems to come out of nowhere to make the radical claim that Jesus abrogated the Jewish dietary laws. To understand Mark 7.19, let's read starting in verse 17. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart, but the stomach, and goes out into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. First, we need to remember that there are at least five reasons why it is implausible that Jesus abrogated the Torah's dietary laws. And second, in the preceding verses in Mark 7, Jesus is arguing about whether eating permitted food with hands that have not been ritually washed causes defilement. So what do we do with Mark 7:19? Before I get to that, if you're enjoying the content so far, it would be awesome if you hit the red subscribe button so you could be notified when new videos come out. Okay, so back to Mark 7:19. Thus he declared all foods clean is a terrible English translation of the Greek text, to put it simply. To quote Jewish scholar Dr. David Flusser, the overwhelming majority of modern translations thoughtlessly accept Origen's interpretation when they take Mark 7:19b to mean, thus he declared all foods clean, although the Greek original can hardly be read in that sense. I agree with Dr. Flusser, but I don't want you just to accept my opinion. I want to show you the process so you can see it for yourself. And just a heads up, this does get technical. Here's the first part of the Greek text. Kai es ton afredrona ek paruatai. A word-for-word -word translation is, and into the sewer or bowels or toilet, it goes out or proceeds. First, we need to translate the word afredrona. Outside of Matthew 15 and Mark 7, this word appears only in one other Jewish text written in Greek. It's found in the Testament of Job, a Second Temple Jewish text, not the book of Job found in the Bible. It was written in the first century BCE or CE, and in chapter 38, Job asked his friend Baldad the following question. Now then, so you may know that my heart is sound, here is my question for you. Food enters the mouth, then water is drunk through the same mouth and sent into the same throat. But whenever the two reaches the bowels, they are separated from each other. Who divides them? And Baldad said, I do not know. Again, I replied and said to him, if you do not understand the functions of the body, how can you understand heavenly matters? It's clear here that aphrodrona refers to a person's bowels, as Job is discussing the digestive system and how the bowels separate food and drink. This text helps inform how we translate the same word aphrodrona in Mark 7.19 as bowels, considering the context also concerns the digestive system. So far we have in Mark 7.19, and into the bowels it proceeds. The second part of the Greek text reads, 
katharitzon panta ta bromata. A word-for-word translation is cleansing or purifying or purging all the foods. And here's the clincher, why thus he declared all foods clean is a terrible translation. Katharitzon is not an adjective. It's a participle. It's a verb. Most English translations of Mark 7.19 mistakenly translate katharitzon as an adjective when in fact it's a type of verb. Let's bring all this together. Similar to other languages like Spanish, Greek words have grammatical gender. They can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. And because the noun aphrodrona and the particle katharitzon are both masculine, this indicates that the bowels, the intestines, are cleansing or purifying or purging all the foods that entered into the person's body. With all that said, here's my translation of Mark 7 verse 18b through 19. Do you not see that all the foods entering into a person from the outside cannot defile because it does not enter into the heart, but into the stomach and proceeds into the bowels, purging all the foods? Jesus is not abrogating the Jewish dietary laws. Within the context of a debate about ritual hand washing, Jesus argues that the Pharisees change the source of impurity and reverse the direction it moves. Jesus succinctly teaches what the Torah says about impurity. Impurity does not enter the body, it comes out of the body. When Jesus' disciples ask him about his teaching, Jesus re-emphasizes the source and direction of impurity and then follows that up with a vivid description of how food passes through the digestive system purging the food. And Matthew 15 verse 17 confirms that Jesus is talking about the digestive system as Matthew condenses Jesus' saying to be, Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes into the bowels? Dr. Daniel Boyarin writes, Jesus asserts that foods that go into the body don't make the body impure. Only things that come out of the body have the power to contaminate. So really, what the gospel describes is a Jesus who rejects the Pharisaic extension of these purity laws beyond their original specific biblical foundations. He is not rejecting the Torah's rules and practices, but upholding them. Boyarin is spot on. Let's continue reading Mark 7, verse 20 through 23. And he said, It is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Again, Jesus is teaching Torah straight up. According to the Torah, sin defiles a person. For example, after giving a long list of sexual sins, Leviticus 18 verse 24 and then verse 30 says, Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, for by all these practices the nations I am casting out before you had defiled themselves. Keep my charge not to commit any of these abominations that were done before you and not to defile yourselves by them. I am the Lord your God. The Pharisees uphold their tradition of ritual handwashing, motivated by a model of ritual impurity in contradiction to the Torah, at the expense of becoming morally impure through their disobedience to God's commandments. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 7 verse 9, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For a final piece of evidence that Jesus' teaching is not about the Jewish dietary laws, take a look at Mark 7 verse 23 in comparison to the parallel verse in Matthew 15 verse 20. Mark condenses Jesus' saying as all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. Matthew includes Jesus' line, these are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus' teaching is about purity and hand-washing, not the Torah's dietary instructions. I do want to make a clarification for the sake of not being misunderstood. 
Just because Jesus argues against these Pharisees for their hypocrisy and view of impurity, that does not mean that Jesus was against the Jewish people participating in the Jewish custom of ritual hand-washing itself or any other Jewish tradition that doesn't contradict scripture for that matter. Jesus is against the Pharisees' motivation for their hand-washing and their hypocrisy. We know that Jesus was not against hand-washing itself because in Mark 7, verse 1 through 2, we learn that some of Jesus' disciples do wash their hands, and Jesus also likely washed his hands. Jesus is fine with hand-washing, but not for the reasons the Pharisees are giving. I think participating in the Jewish custom of hand-washing is great, and I'm an even bigger advocate of hand-washing in general. If you learned something new, click the red subscribe button so you can be notified when new videos come out. Also, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the arguments I made in the comments below, whether you agree or you disagree. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.